Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar. In 1960, the income gap between the fifth of the world's people in the richest countries versus the fifth in the poorest countries was 30 to 1. By 1998, it was 74 to 1. While global GNP rose 40% between 1970 and 1985, those in poverty actually increased by 17%. While from 1985 to 2000, those living on less than $1 a day increased by 18%. Even the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress admitted that there is a mere 40% success rate of all World Bank projects. In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70%. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20% to 6%. In fact, by the year 2000, 50% of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are U.S. based. Walmart, General Motors, and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia, and many others. And, as protective trade barriers are broken down, currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets, and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism, the empire expands. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts Statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly based not on human life but financial and corporate power. And as the inequality grows naturally more and more people are becoming desperate. So the establishment was forced to come up with a new way to deal with anyone who challenges the system. 
so they gave birth to the terrorist. The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s. In 2007, the Department of Defense received $161.8 billion for the so-called global war on terrorism. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, in 2004, roughly 2,000 people were killed internationally due to supposed terrorist acts. Of that number, 70 were American. Using this number as a general average, which is extremely generous, it is interesting to note that twice as many people die from peanut allergies a year than from terrorist acts. Concurrently, the leading cause of death in America is coronary heart disease, killing roughly 450,000 each year. And in 2007, the government's allocation of funds for research on this issue was about $3 billion. This means that the U.S. government in 2007 spent 54 times the amount for preventing terrorism than it spent for preventing a disease which kills 6,600 times more people annually than terrorism does. Yet, as the name terrorism and Al-Qaeda are arbitrarily stamped on every news report relating to any action taken against U.S. interests, the myth grows wider. In mid-2008, the U.S. Attorney General actually proposed that the U.S. Congress officially declare war against the fantasy. Not to mention, as of July 2008, there are now over one million people currently on the U.S. terrorist watch list. These so-called counterterrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that condemns poor populations to sweatshop slavery for the benefit of Madison Avenue? Or that engineers false flag terror attacks for the sake of manipulation? Or that generates built-in modes of social operation which are inherently exploitative? Or that systematically reduces civil liberties and violates human rights in order to protect itself from its own shortcomings? How do we deal with the numerous covert institutions such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, and other undemocratically elected groups which, behind closed doors, 
collude to control the political, financial, social, and environmental elements of our lives. In order to find the answer, we must first find the true underlying cause. For the fact is, the selfish, corrupt, power, and profit-based groups are not the true source of the problem. They are symptoms. My name is Jock Fresco. I'm an industrial designer and a social engineer. I'm very much interested in society in developing a system that might be sustainable for all people. First of all, the word corruption is a monetary invention. That aberrant behavior, behavior that's disruptive to the well-being of people, while you're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior appears to be environmentally determined, meaning if you were raised by the Seminole Indians as a baby, never saw anything else, you'd hold that value system. And this goes for nations, it goes for individuals, for families. They try to indoctrinate their children to their particular faith and their country and make them feel like they're part of that. And they build a society which they call established. They establish a workable point of view and tend to perpetuate that, whereas all societies are really emergent, not established. And so they fight new ideas that would interfere with the establishment. Governments try to perpetuate that which keeps them in power. People are not elected to political office to change things. They're put there to keep things the way they are. So you see, the basis of corruption is in our society. I mean, make it clear, all nations then are basically corrupt because they tend to uphold existing institutions. I don't mean to uphold or downgrade all nations, but communism, socialism, fascism, the free enterprise system, and all other subcultures are the same. They are all basically corrupt. The most fundamental characteristic of our social institutions is the necessity for self-preservation. Whether dealing with a corporation, a religion, or a government, the foremost interest is to preserve the institution itself. For instance, the last thing an oil company would ever want is the utilization of energy that was outside of its control, for it makes that company less relevant to society. Likewise, the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union was, in reality, a way to preserve and perpetuate the established economic and global hegemony of the United States. Similarly, religions conditioned people to feel guilty for natural inclinations, each claiming to offer the only path to forgiveness and salvation. At the heart of this institutional self-preservation lies the monetary system. For it is money that provides the means for power and survival. Therefore, just as a poor person might be forced to steal in order to survive, it is a natural inclination to do whatever is needed to continue an institution's profitability. This makes it inherently difficult for profit-based institutions to change, for it puts in jeopardy not only the survival of large groups of people, but also the coveted materialistic lifestyles associated with affluence and power. Therefore, the paralyzing necessity to preserve an institution, regardless of its social relevance, is largely rooted in the need for money or profit. What's in it for me is why people think. And so if a man makes money selling a certain product, naturally he's going to fight the existence of another product that may threaten his institution. Therefore, people cannot be fair, and people do not trust each other. A guy will come over to you and say, I got just the house you're looking for. He's a salesman. When a doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out, I don't know if he's trying to pay off a yacht or whether my kidney has to come out. It's hard 